ladies and gentlemen, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening, depending where you are in the world. Welcome to all of you, and in particular those of you who woke up early or stayed up late to join us at this time. My name is Serge Dumont, co-founder and vice chairman of Impact Wave, a new social media platform that connects people, business, and philanthropy for social good, and which will launch next week in New York. I will have the pleasure of chairing this session. Allow me to first congratulate Frank Richter and wish him and the Horace's team a very successful. The topic of our session today is Transform in Action, Cooperating Beyond Post-COVID. To address this question over the next 45 minutes, we will have the privilege of a distinguished panel with a wide breadth of expertise from around the world. They are Maria Todorova, PhD, CEO of DG Agora, author of books about artificial intelligence and future studies, former member of parliament and advisor to the president of Bulgaria. And she is joined Bulgaria. Welcome, Mariana. We also have Royston President C. Spock, a United Nations recognized and a campaigner for the development of self-sustaining solutions for people, organizations, and communities, and a thought leader in human geography and the development of resilience in crisis. Royston is joining us from Geneva. Welcome, Royston. Louis Lehman, mentor with One Young World, is joining us from Melbourne, Australia. Welcome, Louis. And last but not least, Dr. Amy Elestiano Dardak, Vice Governor of East Java, the second largest province in the Republic of Indonesia, which counts 40 people. Welcome, Dr. Dardak. Suman Bose is regrettable. We would have welcomed his perspective from India. Sadly, his mother just passed away. Suman, our thoughts are with you and your family. While we don't have gender parity on this panel, I'm glad we have gender diversity. Mariana, I will first turn to you on the topic. I will then turn to each of the panelists to give us their perspe perspective for five, six minutes, and then we will rebound on some of the points raised and have a discussion. You're welcome to send me questions you wish to ask, or grab the mic. Mariana, the global vaccine developers have fostered a sharing system with, while competing commercially. And we are now taking on the natural mutations of COVID-19, hoping for a universal vaccine. The pandemic has illustrated how nations could foster a shared humanitarian view. We have also witnessed areas where cooperation did not materialize. Can you tell us what we have learned, what is seen, and what is needed to better handle the next pandemic and other crises that require global cooperation, like climate, climate change or financial crisis. Mariana? Uh, thank you, Serge. It's really a very important issue, and uh, I like the way you approach it, ethical approach, so I try to provide the kind of framework and we can continue with them. COVID-19 really demonstrates the need to change the paradigm along which the world moves and is governed. And the successful approach of functioning and development in each sphere is on the way of human-centric democratization, decentralization and digitalization. And my claim as a futurist is that we are entering the era of co-creation from co-creation of solutions, services, to co-creation of meaning and values. Uh, can we transform the current situation so that it does not seem like almost a digital authoritarianism or lack of physical freedom and dictates of victims? Yes, I think so, but by including in digitalization the human decision-making of as possible. And this was the driving force behind my startup company to invent a blockchain-based platform for electronic voting and decision-making that allows digital shareholders and stakeholders activism. Uh, DJ Agora, which is the name of the platform, 
is a digital software as a service created to empower public companies, social and civil uh, movements, large NGOs, political parties, governmental bodies, uh, with an effective and communication system that brings engagement of the shareholders, customers, stakeholders uh, in an inclusive and secure way. And what is possible to apply the so-called liquid or delegative democracy for a much more fluid and transparent type of management and governance. And what is liquid democracy? It's a way to vote directly or to delegate your voting right to a confided expert during the decision making or consent process. And through delegation, people with domains are able to better influence the outcome of decisions, which in turn leads to an overall better governance and uh, of the bodies. And because of this, liquid democracy naturally derives into meritocracy, where decisions are made by those who have the kind of knowledge and experience required to make uh, really good decisions. And by delegating trust, voting rights, individuals, investors uh, can form mini clusters in support of a particular measure or strategy. Uh, the organizations which aim to create their own digital community, a digital twin, provide the Jagura platform as a service to their stakeholders and consumers. And it collects feedback, engage users, takes into account their needs, and makes them a factor in decision-making process. First, I created Digiagora for government structures, uh, large organizations such as the UN and political parties. But in fact, I saw that it is quite effective for public companies as well. And all those that want to decentralize and the, the hierarchize to become green and to be listed on the stock exchange with an exclusive comparative advantage or to improve their damage image can use the Jaguar. Uh, responsible investments means to consider people, planet, purpose and prosperity, which is also a niche for new stock markets. And sustainability now after COVID-19 is a fiduciary issue and co-creation with the stakeholders, users and customers is of extremely importance because sustainable capitalism integrates environmental, social and governance factors. Um, and I, as I said before, large organizations such as United Nations and World Bank can use the platform as a digital collective mechanism for decision uh, making concerning humanity and the global collaboration and global challenges. The same goes for gov governments that need to target more stakeholders to avoid climate catastrophe, uh, ecological uh, problems, uh, or ensuing major financial crisis, for example. So I think we, uh, we are entering uh, an era of uh, global challenges, global problems, and that's why we need to elaborate mechanisms for cooperation and uh, uh, contribution and I think digital activism is a good approach to that. This is my first insights. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mariana. I'll turn to Luis and ask you the same question. What is your viewpoint? Thank you so much, Serge. Um, can you hear me there? Yes, we can hear you. Thank you. Sorry, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Mariana, that was very insightful. Well, I'm gonna actually give a completely different approach to the question though. Um, what is it that we've learned about COVID? What is it that COVID has come to ta taught us at the same time with any other financial crises or any crisis of any nature? Um, I strongly believe that nothing really happens by coincidence or randomly. There's always a purpose. Whether we understand that purpose or not, uh, that's a different story. But um, 
To me, for example, COVID has come to really center me, to ground me, to really connect uh, to, with myself. Um, it does really actually put our egos in check, whether we like it or not. And it's something that is very important and really relevant. Uh, it, has made, actually, it has made us realize at the same time that we are all equal, regardless of you know, religion, beliefs, ethnicity. A lot of people may not actually uh, agree with this concept, but, though, but we're more connected than ever. And so um, I've actually come to appreciate more as well you know, the things that I have rather than uh, the things that I don't have or complaining about the things that I wish to have. This is, these are the things that really COVID has actually come to, to taught me personally. Um, and it's being, uh, you know, trans, transformative. It's, I think it's a golden opportunity uh, to really pause, to let go of the things that don't matter and to really connect with ourselves. So um, in saying this, I'd like to actually quote from Albert Einstein, something that I believe uh, it's on point about crisis. And it says like, like this. Let us not pretend that things will change if we keep on doing the same things. A crisis can be a real blessing to any person, to any nation. For all crises bring progress. Creative is born from anguish, just like the day is born from the dark night. It is in crisis that inventive is born, as well as discoveries and big strategies. Who overcome crisis overcomes himself without getting overcome. Who blames his failure to a crisis neglects his own talent. And it's more respectful to problems than to solutions. Incompetence is the true crisis. It is in the crisis where we can show the very best in us. To speak about a crisis is to promote it. Not to speak about it is to exalt conformism. So what does this quote actually tell us? I think it's very powerful, though, because either we can actually bring the very best of us or we can actually choose. Obviously, we have free will to go into the victim consciousness and complain and winch, and which is normally what I've been actually experimenting around me, a lot of negativity, right? Um, in saying this, COVID actually, and as any other crises, have actually been a, a real messenger. They're not the enemy. We shouldn't be actually looking at them as the enemy. They've come here to wake us up, to really give us a slap, in, a slap in the face and tell us, hey, we need to change the course of things, the way we operate, the way we conduct ourselves, the way we actually treat others, and the way we treat ourselves. Now, we all actually strive for, obviously, push for policies and new institutions and, uh, you know, relying on big tech, um, trying to solve the environmental problems. Well, I believe that's the wrong narrative, though, because true and real change starts with ourselves. Everything is connected. Everything in this universe is energy. So just to connect the dots here and to bring the audience uh, to the attention of the butterfly effect, which I'm pretty sure everyone would have heard of. Um, if there's a butterfly in the Amazon that flaps its wings, it eventually might cause a sandstorm in the Sahara or a typhoon in Japan. How is this possible? This is actually quantum science. And so... This is exactly the same thing that happens with us, right? Every single thought, every single deed, every action, every word that we say does have a, an, an effect, a change. Uh, not only in our communities, not only with ourselves, but everywhere around the world. So it is the behavioral interactions of mankind that drive the, the universe, establishing whether the positive or negative conditions are, are global of our global existence. Every time we blame others, we actually relinquish in control. So the reason why a lot of things do not materialize uh, in some areas, it's because simply we don't act with a true intention to change things. There's always hidden agendas somewhere uh, in the middle. Everyone that is trying to influence markets or processes or policies is not really being the cause. It's actually being the effect. If you need people to change, you become the effect, not the cause. Something very powerful and I think very important to address, though. And finally, I'd like to just uh, say the, the, the final statement. I do believe that the success or failure of humanity's effort to remove of all chaos depends entirely on consciousness.
what is in our consciousness? What is it our intention, our true intentions that drives us to actually build things, create things? What are we doing? Is it for the sake of others to share, to give? If it doesn't come with that intention, maybe you get results, but I can guarantee you it's not going to be everlasting. It's going to be temporary. So let's ask ourselves, you know, what are we doing here? What is our true purpose? How are we inspiring and empowering other people to be their best? Thank you so much. That's my message. Thank you so much, Luis, for these inspiring words. Uh, I see that Royston has joined us. Welcome, Royston. Uh, you're joining us from Geneva, Switzerland, correct, Royston? Hello? Can you hear us? Okay, we seem to be having some problems. So, Dr. Datak, I will, I will turn to you first before Royston. And Indonesia, the country you're, you, you, you come from and you're calling from, has a population of 214 million people. And your own province, the second largest, has 40 million people. Can you tell us, as leader of this country, what you believe has gone well in, term, in terms of establishing cooperation to resolve the pandemic issue? And what are the learnings? What can we do better for the future? Looking back, thank you very much, uh, Sergei. Uh, looking back at the uh, beginning of the pandemic, uh, things were much harder because uh, none of us actually have any idea what what this pandemic entails. Uh, and therefore, uh, global cooperation was very important. And we happened to communicate very intensively with uh, countries who have had that issue and who have had more advancements in uh, developing solutions. Uh, for example, I mean, no, no, no countries are uh, equipped uh, sufficiently to handle such communicable disease. Uh, the, you know, as, as, as a former mayor and now vice governor, uh, our focus in the healthcare system was on uh, non-communicable diseases like uh, hypertension, diabetes. So we don't build our uh, hospitals to actually anticipate such, uh, uh, you know, virus-driven uh, diseases. So uh, through partnerships with a lot of consulate generals who are uh, based in Surabaya, the capital of our province, uh, we managed to tap into uh, experiences both from Europe, uh, from East Asia. And, and also, I think uh, uh, there is also a network of academics. Uh, uh, you know, uh, we have one of the largest uh, hospital and university hospital in Indonesia. So a lot of teachers and also the senior um, medical doctors are communicating cross-border between countries to really comprehend what this, this is all about. And, and that was very intensive during the first semester of the pandemic, especially during the first quarter, uh, during the month of March, April, and May. Uh, and uh, then subsequently, a lot of countries begin to develop their internal capacity to start handling uh, while continuing to also be very uh, uh, proactive in finding out advancements in other countries. It's an example of creation is very important because you don't face an issue uh, that relates only to your country. Uh, ensuring that there is a smooth flow of logistics, uh, ensuring that uh, Indonesian or East Java citizens who live abroad, uh, we can communicate with them I have a personal experience. I have a cousin who's living in uh, Italy who was uh, hospitalized for, not for COVID, but, uh, but during at times like this, it's very difficult to fly my, uh, her family over to uh, Italy to visit. And, and we, we believe that during the time of COVID, there will be a lot of such uh, circumstances that needs to be taken into account. And this is a time where humanity prevails because a lot of compassion are being, and we want to extend the same compassion to people from other countries who live in Indonesia, who live in East Java. It's a moment to test the compassion. For practicality purpose, it's easier to just shut the border. But we know that there is also that level of empathy that we extend. 
And that is going to be a very important testament for our partnership going forward. Uh, I think COVID-19 fortunately has brought the best of us instead of the worst of us. We, we, we saw a lot of cooperation taking place. There were a bit of issues on the vaccine, on the fact that there may be some uh, uh, distribution more inclined towards the more developed nations, but we see a very swift move by the developing by the developed countries to ensure that that is not the case, that vaccines are distributed uh, fairly uh, uh, across the globe. And, and I'm very optimistic that this will become a, a moment of truth where humanity prevails over national borders. I mean, COVID is definitely uh, a time when humanity rises to its best in the world. I mean, I'm speaking as a as, as somebody who who runs this 40 million province and has been helped by the great cooperation between countries, irrespective of where you are. It's not just between Asian countries, it's, it's between different regions. Thank you, Dr. Datak, for this very optimistic, this very optimistic outlook uh, of a difficult situation that you managed well. Um, I see that we have Royston now. Royston, can you hear us? Can you hear me? Yes, and we can hear you. Welcome. I believe you're joining us from Geneva. Yes, you seem to be very, very far away, though. Um, <laughs> the, the question that was asked was that we've seen uh, uh, a lot of cooperation, as Dr. Datak was saying, to resolve the COVID crisis. Can you tell us from your perspective what we have learned, what has gone well, and what need to be done to ensure that the next crisis, whether it be a pandemic or a financial crisis or the mitigation of climate change, can be done better? I think my first view is the challenge of mindsets. Royston, can you, you, can you raise your voice a little bit? We can barely hear you. I think Thank the you. first thing is the challenge of mindsets. I remember I, I gave evidence to the Royal Society in 2008, looking at many of the things that we've experienced, um, but many of that really wasn't listened to. So I think that we have to create a framework where we start listening and as opposed to just knee-jerk reactions. I think we're seeing from this pandemic that there is a possibility to cooperate. And again, it's amazing how fast vaccines have been produced. Uh, we have the opportunity to extend that cooperation into other areas like climate change, where we're seeing the potential for massive disasters. In many ways, we're beyond the tipping point. So we have to find ways that we can use the new technologies of communication, uh, use the new technologies to spot events before they happen, creating mechanisms to deal with the fear which is obviously what's been driving the mindsets and create hope i believe that i was speaking to the director general of unog not so long ago and she said that the biggest challenge is trust and that if there is fear there is no trust if there's no trust there's no cooperation and you are in a spiral of, of negative response we have to find a way where we can recognize that we're all part of the same humanity. We have to be able to create, I believe, loving kindness as a framework for hope. I believe that we have to find ways of communicating where we share things that we agree on rather than just focus on difference. I believe that where we sit now, we have even worse pandemics waiting in the wings. We saw some time ago that the uh, the SARS, the N95, the uh, N5N1 uh, virus had already gone human to human transfer. And we saw in the Cairo cluster, fortunately, it burnt out before it went any worse. But there you're talking about 75% mortality and an R of something like 20. We're seeing the MERS virus in the Middle East already gone into air conditioning systems. Uh, fortunately, the mortality is around 35%. So we've, we're dealing with COVID with an R of perhaps one to two. We've, we're seeing uh, the Indian variant, or we call it the Indian variant, but it isn't. It's just a mutation. There are 100 variants already there. And as the virus grows, it learns to become 
more resilient and therefore your even conventional vaccination strategies are challenged because you have to vaccinate 80% of the population to create a cordon sanitaire. I believe that when you look at how we deal with crisis, whether it's a pandemic, whether it's a natural or complex disaster, it's all about people operating in communities and small communities and neighbourliness. And I think that's probably what we've lost in the last few generations, where people have not really been looking after each other. I think in the future we have created a paradigm where we look after each other in families and communities in organizations and countries and we recognize that the boundaries of difference are really irrelevant when it comes to challenges that affect the entire world the entire population and in fact the, in fact the world in the sense that we we're destroying it at a rapid pace at the moment we the extinction of species the extinction of morality the extinction of of love and I think we have to move to hope rather than fear and look at ways in which we can work together rather than celebrate difference. And in CSPOT, we're focused on how to create self-sustaining communities uh, through health, education and enterprise. And it's only really when you put them together that you can have longitudinal outcomes. The United Nations is a classic example of working in silos. And even the United Nations is beginning to say we can only be effective if we work together. And that means that the member states have to work together. It's not just uh, making statements at meetings. It's about really genuinely finding ways to work together for the benefit of all. Over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Royston. Um, You've, uh, thank you all for your perspective. Maybe what I'd like to do first is to direct a question to uh, to Dr. Datak here, and then we, we can start our conversation. We've, we've heard a lot of very optimistic and, and positive words, uh, compassion, empathy. I was glad to hear this word. And, um, and Louis actually uh, quoted Einstein uh, saying that the crisis can be a blessing. Uh, in fact, this crisis has not been a blessing for all. 400 million jobs have been lost uh, around the world because of the pandemic, and it has affected uh, disproportionately the most uh, vulnerable people. Um, the question I'd like to, to ask you, Dr. Data, because you've, you've highlighted how the way to deal successfully with a crisis of this nature is collaboration, both internal scientists and various stakeholders. Um, I think somebody has the mic on. If you can mute yourself, that will uh, ensure that we have a quiet environment. Um, so you need internal cooperation and international cooperation. It, the feeling that a lot of people have is that nationalism has actually been the major stumbling block. As um, Royston was saying, people work in silos. As you mentioned, Dr. Royston, the first reaction has been very often to close the borders. Now, are the international organizations structured in a, a way that fosters this international cooperation and are they breaking the silos? What could be done to actually improve a specific area, which is crucial? Yeah, it's very interesting because prior to the COVID-19 uh, pandemic, we saw a global landscape that is very, uh, you know, uh, very much uh, predominated by issues of ultra-nationalism emerging in the political landscapes of many countries without without exception uh, be it the western countries or even eastern countries we're seeing majoritarianism prevailing uh, or at least emerging and indonesia is not an exception uh, but uh, yeah i mean the, if that is the case we knew that uh, uh, logically or consequently uh, in the time of pandemic, uh, there will be a lack of cooperation, which was not the case. We saw there was a global concerted effort to ensure that uh, that uh, we, we all came up with uh, uh, scaling up of productions. Uh, we managed to start exporting uh, hazardous uh, suits for 
medical personnel and vice versa. We continue to bring in uh, ventilators from overseas. I, I think uh, I just want to bring back some one economic reality. Uh, during the month of January to March, COVID was not yet in Indonesia. Pretty much not yet in Indonesia. It was a more of a China phenomenon and maybe some part of Europe, uh, but very limited. Uh, but the fact is, our economic growth has decreased by half during that time. So even without having COVID in our our hometown, I mean in our home, we we would still suffer significantly from global economic. Right now, we saw how container prices have risen uh, massively because Western countries aren't sending things to the Eastern part of, of, of the globe. Uh, and containers are not only rare, they're also very expensive, even if you can get those. And, and it, we suffer because the global supply chain, value chain in, in reality have, you know, is so uh, intertwined. So uh, it is always a temptation for Indonesia or, you know, to, to be self, even within Indonesia, uh, local governments always talk about self-sufficiency. They always talk about why are we buying things that we can make? And, and there's always a temptation to do so. Employment and then lack of growth. And you see, okay, let's substitute something that we've been buying elsewhere. But the reality is that uh, never all, as long as those efforts have been uh, promoted but we, we saw at the same time uh, an, an unavoidable uh, interdependence already being very well embedded in, in our economies in our societies and, and also at, at, at very important times when we know that uh, you know uh, societies have also been very uh, intertwined so going back to your question whether nationality uh, there is going to be a future uh, recurrence of nationalism sentiments that will uh, obstruct uh, desire to cooperate. Uh, I, I believe that it's 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 always going to be a political commodity, uh, especially uh, in between each country. Uh, there are issues about about us being quite relaxed about opening our borders as a counter argument against the government imposing some mobility restrictions within the country. But so, so that those tensions may exist. Uh, it may be commoditized by certain political groups. Uh, but I think uh, the people are quite uh, mm -hmm. open-minded enough, at least in Indonesia uh, and East Java in our province, to know that uh, certain standard, you know, uh, political, uh, I, 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 I'm sorry, what I meant is certain standard international understanding needs to be respected. So it may not go that far. You know, I'm, of course, I'm really speaking abstract here because there is a particular measure. But, but I think that, that that's as much as I can say with regards. So we are hosting the G20 summit to next year. So that will be a good momentum for Indonesia to become more international uh, oriented as well. Excellent. Excellent. Well, thank you so much, Dr. Tatak. Does any of the things that we've heard lead you to any comments, uh, Luis or Mariana? I think we've lost Royston again. Um, I like the metaphor that uh, Luis used about uh, butterfly. Actually, uh, it is uh, a story written by Ray Bradbury and uh, uh, mathematician and physician uh, warrants uh, is uh, the man who uh, may try to make a global model to to predict what would happen with with the world using the uh, system theory and uh, chaos theory. And uh, what he found was that uh, we cannot predict uh, what would happen. We just uh, can uh, catch some certain specific elements, but we still don't know much about uh, the, the chaos and the chaos theory. And what is chaos sometimes might be uh, something that is an order, but we don't have enough knowledge. And I'm very much satisfied that we seem to have a consensus that um, COVID-19 is a wake-up call for uh, uh, setting up our mindset towards a new attitude that we need to create a collective intelligence system 
uh, that will act on behalf of huma humanity and that we need to, to create this because we need a new mechanism of uh, decision making. Uh, so, uh, because I'm working mostly on artificial intelligence and digital technology, I see that uh, COVID-19 was a trigger also for robotization, automatization and uh, entry of artificial intelligence. Uh, but besides these instruments and this technology help us, we also need to consider to a certain extent we will allow this technology to develop because they might cause also a lot of problems like technological uh, unemployment, um, dehumanization of economy and services, and that might provide again another another crisis. Uh, so this is a time to think philosophically uh, on a humanitarian way and to consider all these uh, very fast growing changes. Sorry, Luis, any comment? Uh, you, thank you, Serge. Well, yes, the only comment is, again, uh, coming back to the consciousness of people. Uh, Mar Mar Mariana actually mentioned about how do we measure chaos if it's unpredictable or predictable. Quite frankly, I guess we have the answers already within ourselves. We create our own chaos in our lives. I mean, we either actually drive our own lives to hell or not. I mean, it's... I think to me, it's pretty clear that every single action, every single thing that we do has uh, uh, an effect. Everything in this universe is cause and effect. So no, we tend to rely on robots or machines or it's great to create all this technology. Don't get me wrong. I love it. Um, however, though, we are the brains behind that technology. And it's the intention and the consciousness that we put behind those machines or those robots or those um, new innovations that will ultimately drive them to do either good or bad. It's all intention. So that's the only thing that I just wanted to address uh, upon that. Thank you. Thank you, Luis. I see that we have uh, people in the, that are active in the room and that would like to ask questions. I see Yun Chen. Yun Chen, would you like to ask a question? If so, you can grab the mic. All right. And there's also Bernard Moon. Bernard, would you like would you like to ask a question? Well, feel free at any time to interrupt us and ask the question. The I'd like to ask you one question that really troubles me, which is that. I believe, as several of you have highlighted in one form or another, that trust is a very essential ingredient to build more resilient organizations to deal with crisis. But how do we foster trust in a world that is sorely lacking of it? Do you have any thought on that? I'll, I'll have a go at that, Serge, if I may, um, just very briefly. Because, again, coming from the premise that everything in this universe is energy, we are energy, when we actually broadcast that trust to others, it will come back to us. So it starts with ourselves. We normally expect others to actually do things first and then we'll follow because we have that sheep mentality of following and not really thinking for ourselves, not really doing things for ourselves. So if I want some, my neighbor to trust me, I need to actually put that trust first, to give first. If my neighbor decides, for example, not to actually give that back to me, that it's not my problem. It's actually his problem or her problem. So again, it, for me, it's simple. It, it starts with us. We're not, not always going to be reciprocated, but uh, we need to set the example. That's it. I remember attending a conference. Uh, one was the keynote speaker, was uh, the brother of Elon Musk, Elon Musk, and he said that trust is a currency of our time. 
we need uh, this as a necessity, but still don't know how to elaborate this mechanism in our relationship. So uh, probably this is a thing we have to work on. And uh, I would uh, like to ask if there are some specific questions to me, because I have to leave three minutes earlier. Yes, we're coming to the end of our panel. I think we still have four minutes. So maybe if there uh, are, are there anything, you know, is there anything that anybody wants to ask Mariana? If not, what I'd like to do is to ask you, maybe in just one sentence, tell us what you'd like the audience to remember of this conversation from your point of view. Uh, from my point of view, uh, I want uh, the audience to, to remember that we need to cooperate on a new way to use the current technologies for that to create digital and social uh, activism, but to keep the technology human-centric. Thank you. What about you, Royston? Since we have you for a few more seconds, tell us what, what you think. What would you like, in one sentence, the audience to remember about the topic that we've covered just now? Uh, You're breaking out. We can't hear you. I'm not sure if it's me. Can you hear him? I don't think we can hear you. Let me turn to Dr. Datak and I'll come back I'll come back to you, Royston. Dr. Datak, what's your your view on Yeah, uh, I think uh, again I, I still would like um, I would like to still emphasize on the, the compassion. Uh, trust as the uh, currency, of course, uh, trust is not uh, as easy as uh, as it seems and but uh, at the end of the day i think compassion prevails and and that will become a very important uh trigger for uh co international cooperation uh i think i think that that concludes it thank you thank you so much and luis you seem to be having the last word unless we have uh, royston coming back again <laughs> Thank you, Serge. Uh, my last sentence would be, again, the, the very best investment that anyone could do with their lives and affect change globally is to invest in our consciousness. Elevate people's consciousness at all times, wherever we can, to bring out the be very best of ourselves. This is a very wise advice, and I hope that it is heeded by many people. Uh, I. Thank you all very much. We've come to the end of our, of our panel and we've been very good with time. I thank you all and I thank our panelists for their contributions. Thank you all very much. And I hope to be able to see you in real life. Thanks, Serge. Thank you so much. Bye-bye. Take care.